The story of Judges has value as a tragedy. It's a sobering explanation of the human condition, and ultimately it points out the need for God's grace to send a king who will rescue his people. And that's the book of Judges. All right. Hey, uh, first thing I want to point out is I, I goobered up my shirt here. So I got this stain. So you could kind of watch. It's just water. So you could just kind of pay attention to this stain here. And, you know, you could just kind of track how long this message is going to be by the amount. It's kind of the game within the game, you know. There's two things going on at the same time. God's grace, his mercy, his peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And, uh, again, happy Father's Day to all the dads in the house. Um, God's the very best to you fathers. Today we find ourselves in the, uh, the third week of our Judges series and in a wonderfully ironic twist of fate today, it is all about the ladies. Uh, but don't go to sleep on my dad. Don't do it. Don't do it. That's not how God's word works. And I assure you that there is plenty here today for everyone. But it is Father's Day, and since I am one after all, I'd like to show off my family. Ah, uh, there they are. Some of you may know them. There they are. Ah, uh, beautiful. Others might be uh, new to Messiah, so I will briefly point them out. This picture was taken at my daughter Shelby's wedding uh, this past September. And then, guess what? They moved away. Uh, they moved to uh, Grand Junction, Colorado in April, and we miss them dearly. Now, next to Drew is the one that I will be celebrating 35 years of marriage with tomorrow. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. It's a big effort uh, on my part. I've been working with Mary, um, you know, trying to make her a little more kinder, a little more nicer, to, you know, that kind of a thing, if you know her. Yeah, yeah, okay. Next to Sweet Mary Schley is my daughter, Janie. Uh, she serves as a deaconess uh, at uh, Emmanuel Lutheran in Wentzville. She is married to Max, who is a pastor up the road at St. Paul's Lutheran in New Melly. And the one standing next to my right is the one uh, that we call Kate. But if you attend at Messiah Lutheran School, then you call her Miss Schley because she teaches sixth grade here. And next to Kate is Grace. In the fall, Grace is going to be a senior, yes, at Missouri s &T. Thank you. And she is very recently engaged to a young man named Christian, uh, which makes sense. Uh, Christian and Grace should always go together. First dad joke of the day. All right. And then last but not least, you met her once already. There is our boy, Will. He just finished up his first year at the University of Arkansas. Woo, pig, suey. Kind of a big family, but that's my family. Kind of a big deal to me, a big part of my life. Uh, and I share all that with you because today's judge is Deborah. And she's the only female in the bunch. And um, I'm really glad that I get to tell part of her story today as a father of four strong and cheerful and fearless women of faith, I hope this message will have a special significance for them and for your daughters too, as well as for all of us. Okay, let's get into it. As mentioned today, the women get the spotlight with the caveat that the key to this scripture, as well as all of scripture, is to always keep in mind who the true hero is. Now, if you have been with us for the last couple of weeks, then you have heard about the wheel of misfortune that uh, spins throughout the book of Judges. It begins with sin, which then leads to judgment, which eventually brings about repentance, and then God answers with deliverance, and the end result is peace. Aha, but it's not the end, because unfortunately, the cycle starts all over again. Therefore, it is not too surprising for us as we open up to chapter 4 that we find that the Israelites are up to their old tricks again, doing evil in the sight of God. Uh, therefore, the Lord sold them into the hands of the Canaanites. Now, the ruler of the Canaanites is King Jabin. And Jabin has a military commander, and that guy's name is Sisera. Both these guys are huge jerks, and that is a huge understatement. Now, Sisera has at his disposal uh, a war machine 
consisting in the latest of weaponry, which is 900 iron chariots, which would steamroll over any army that would dare stand up to them. Soldiers on foot were absolutely no match against Sisera's chariots of iron. And for 20 years, Jabin controlled the Israelites. Jabin ruled, Jabin reigned, cruelty and crime ran throughout, throughout the land like wolves. Uh, the people were terrified. The farmers hid in forests. Nobody worked the land. Travelers avoided the highways. So no goods were brought in to Israel to buy. No food. Nobody going out. Nobody coming in. No peace. No freedom. No hope. In fact, get this, the people got so desperate that they repented. They repented. They cried out to the Lord. Now, in those days, the Spirit of the Lord lived in a remarkable woman named Deborah. She was a prophetess. Uh, same goes for a prophet. Uh, someone who received God's word directly from the source and then communicated that word to the people. The Bible says that she spent her days holding court, seated beneath a palm tree, and all kinds of people would come to her because she was wise. And they came with their disputes and their arguments, and she'd settle them. They came with their worries and their fears, and she'd calm them. They came with their questions, and she'd answer them. They came looking for some word of the Lord, and she'd speak it. Deborah was a judge. And if I may be a little judgy, I think she's the best judge of the bunch. She comes closer than anybody else to being an authentic, godly leader. And uh, the others, you know, for the most part, are mostly uh, warrior types. But Deborah was more than military. She led beyond the battlefield. She was God's chosen leader who not only rescued, she also ruled. A rescuer and a ruler. Ah, she points us to Jesus is what she does. Okay, let's review our cast of characters so far. We have King Jabin, boo. And we have his military commander, Sisera, boo. And on the other hand, we have Judge Deborah, yay. And now let me introduce to you Barak. Okay, who's Barak? Barak is Israel's military commander. However, he wasn't much of one because they didn't have much of an army. Anyway, Deborah calls for Barak and says something along these lines. Listen up, Barry. This is what the Lord says. Assemble 10,000 men and get ready to take on Sisera and his 900 chariots. For I, the Lord, will give him into your hand. Now, here's the game plan, and this is going to be really important. I want you to do your fighting in the valley of Mount Tabor alongside the Kishon River. And this will come into play later. Barak replies, Deborah, if you go with me, I'm in. I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Hmm. I don't know what to think about that response. What do you think? It doesn't exactly sound strong and courageous, does it? I've read through several commentaries, and I'll tell you the jury is out. Some say he's wimpy. Others say he's just being wise. Interestingly, if you look at Hebrews chapter 11, that's the uh, chapter that spells out all the heroes of the faith, Barak is listed in, uh, in that group. So I don't know. But I will say that it would make sense to bring with you someone who directly communicated with the almighty God himself. I mean, that just, I mean if you're going to take on the military superpower of the day, it might come in really handy to have God's number one messenger along for the ride. So there's that. But on the other hand, Deborah replies, very well, I will go with you. But because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours, 
for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. And so there's that. But she's not busting his chops here. She is just simply stating the facts. Okay, cutting to the chase, here's how the battle plays out. The armies, um, as mentioned, met down in the valley. And it is God who wins the day by sending a torrential rainstorm, which is incredible since this took place during the dry season. It has not rained at all for months. This would be just like today. You step outside on this sunny June afternoon and it's, we get hit with a snowstorm. It would be just absolutely miraculous. Okay, so there's water, water everywhere, and the river valley, you know, the water comes down the mountain and right next to the river, and all of a sudden, it just becomes a soupy swamp. And guess what? 900 iron chariots get stuck in the mud, and every last Canaanite soldier was cut down. Well, almost every one of them. When the going got tough, Sisera got going. He escaped on foot and he ran for his life. Now, the story's not over, but let's hit the pause button here. Before we get to Sisera's gruesome end, we just need to bring up the subject of women's leadership because the career of Deborah obviously leads us to reflect on it. A word of caution though, I will say that time uh, does not allow us to get into all the details, but I will make a few important points. Point one, God gives women the same spiritual gifts that he gives to men. Male and female, he created them made in his image. Another passage comes to mind, New Testament. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. So I'll say it again, God gives women the same spiritual gifts he gives to men. And we see it clearly in our text today. Women can lead. And when God gives the spiritual gift of leadership to women, then women should lead. For example, and I'm just going to point out two, although there are many, many more, but two of the very best leaders that I know happen to be women, and they lead at Messiah. Kristen Bonham, you might know her. She has the gift of leadership. She is smart, she is fearless, and she is faithful. And we are blessed to have an executive like Kristen to head up our Board of Lay Ministry, as well as serve as the president of our congregation. Kristen is also a servant leader. Today, she was serving coffee in the commons. All right, she does it all. She's awesome. Likewise, Joni Smith has the gift of leadership. She is smart, she is fearless, and she is faithful. We are very blessed to have someone with her passion and education and experience leading our school, Fire Appliance. Principal Smith also serves on our executive ministry team. She's got the gift of leadership, many gifts in fact. And on top of all of that, her older brother is super cool. <laughs> but like I said, I could regale you with uh, many more examples of great leaders at Messiah who also happen to be women. Now, having said that and meaning that, there are certain roles in both the Old and the New Testament where God has established positions that he wants only men to play. He set it up like this. In the Old Testament, you have the role or the office of priest. In the New Testament, you have the role of pastor. If anyone wants to oversee a congregation, oversee a church, the Apostle Paul is referring to pastors here. He desires a noble task. Now, the overseer must be above reproach, and he is to be the husband of but one wife, all right? 
And then Paul goes on to list further traits assigned to the job description. So in the New Testament, it's pastor. In the Old Testament, it's priest. That is the only role God has set aside exclusively for men. Other than that, game on. All right, last point, and then we'll get back to the judges. It seems, historically speaking, that there has been a false narrative put forward regarding women and roles within the church. On the one hand, some believe that there is no distinction at all of roles. No distinction at all. While on the opposite side, others claim that women should sit on the sidelines and, if anything, serve in some, you know, diminutive role. But never teaching, never leading, never administrating. And in my understanding of Scripture, I just don't see a claim for either of these doctrines. My point, however, is not to disparage other churches who organize differently than we do, but rather just to say I am grateful to the women who lead at Messiah. And I'm very proud of my daughters who lead and serve in their churches as well. Thank you for stepping up. Now, speaking of which, uh, we need all the Christ followers to step up. All right? The church, our church, our world, our neighborhoods, our schools, our places of work, our families need godly men and godly women and godly boys and godly girls to step up, lead in the ways of Jesus. Okay, let's return to the scene. We haven't much time, but uh, we got to get to this because there is just a lot at stake. Yes, that is another dad joke um, with a few more to uh, follow. It's Father's Day, so hey, all right. And on top of that, let me just tell you, it's a grisly tale. So just, you know, permit me to lighten it up just a little bit. Okay. Through God's miraculous intervention, the Canaanite army has been soundly defeated. And Commander Sisera, boo, he is running for his life. And here is where the story gets intense. That's right. Sisera has reached the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Here's a little backstory. Jael's husband, Heber, has made a treaty with the Canaanite king, Jabin. Boo, remember him. Okay, so Sisera knew about this treaty. Therefore, hiding out in Heber's tent seemed like a great place to rest until, you know, the heat blew over. Wrong move, dude. Heber isn't home, but his wife is. And Jael is an awesome hostess. She met him warmly. She invited him into the tent. She gave him a nice drink of milk. She tucked him in for a nap. Not sure if she offered him a uh, you know, chocolate chip cookie and sung him a lullaby, but it uh, doesn't say. Nevertheless, Sisera falls asleep. He could rest knowing that there was this peace agreement between his king and Jael's husband, Heber the Kenite. He thought he was safe, but here is the piercing truth. He was wrong. He was dead wrong. You know why? Because Sisera didn't know his Bible history. And it cost him. J.L., all right, and husband, were Kenites. The Kenites were the descendants of Moses' father-in-law. The Kenites and the Israelites had been allies for generations. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years together. They entered the promised land together. They settled among the tribe of Judah. But Heber, though, as you'll recall, had broken away from the other Kenites, and he had settled in with King Jabin of the Canaanites. Now, here is the point that I want to hammer home. While on the surface, it may seem that there is no reason at all for J.L. to take out Sisera other than maybe to spite her husband, but that is not it. She was, in fact, keeping an older commitment to the people of Israel and to their God. So with this in mind, she turns from gracious host to lethal assassin. 
she picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to asleep exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. Not sure if that last part is necessary. <laughs> it seems like an obvious point. But you talk about giving someone a splitting headache. She nailed it. I mean, clearly JL had that guy pegged. All right, all right, enough of that. But it was a smashing victory. All right, no more dad jokes. I am really putting away for real this time. But the story ends, and the battle is won, and it is celebration time, and Deborah and Barak burst forth in the praise, and they sing a song, all of chapter 5, about this God who saved them and those that he used for his purpose, especially Jael, the woman who took down that no good Sisera, and he was no good. Deborah sarcastically sings as she is picturing Sisera's mother looking out the window, waiting for him to return victorious. Why is this chariot so long in coming? Why is the clatter of its chariots delayed? And then Sisera's mom keeps answering herself, are they not finding and dividing spoils? A girl or two for each man? Colorful garments as plunder for him and some fancy jewelry for me. That sounds nice, but it's really an unhelpful translation. It's much worse than that. That part about a girl or two for each man. Come on, you know what that's referring to. The Hebrew word there is not girl. It's wench or slave girl. Sisera captured women and girls, took advantage of them, and then either kept them or sold them off as a certain kind of slave. All right, as a father of four daughters, he had that tent peg coming. Probably had a couple of them coming, if you ask me. But the nightmare was over, and there you have it. The women get the spotlight today. Deborah leads Israel out from under Jabin's oppression, and Jael ends Sisera's reign of terror against women. It's two women who bring them down, and the land had peace for 40 years. It's a great story. Justice is served. The women are rightly highlighted. But remember the caveat. Uh, the key to the scripture, as well as all of scripture, is to keep in mind who the true hero is. Deborah was a remarkable woman, a rescuer and a ruler. Jael was fearless and a most unexpected hero. But ultimately, these women were the chosen instruments in the hand of a faithful and a mighty God. And so let me wrap it up. Let me put a bow on it with these three quick points. One, you and I need a hero. Someone fearless. Someone wise. A true ruler. The ultimate judge. An eternal rescuer. And that's why this story is in the Bible. It points us to our Savior, our Redeemer, our Deliverer, Jesus Christ. We need a Savior to which all human saviors point to. Newsflash, we live in a troubled time too. We're very tempted as a society, as a country. Oh, come on, you know it. We cling to many false idols. We put our hopes in so many foolish things. We're captivated, just captivated by the false gods of this world. Now, as individuals, you know we go through our cycles too, right? You've been there, me too. 
Oh, man, we are sometimes seasons. We are on fire for the Lord, right? Never miss a Sunday. We are on fire. We follow. We worship, man. We're in. We might even be in the Bible study or something like that. Wow, we're in. And then we cave. My hunch is life gets too good. That's my hunch. And we forget. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Oh, we wander, we grow lukewarm. Oh, we need help. We need a savior. Thank God that it's not about our willpower, our heart, our ability our stick to itness, but it's about his love, his mercy, his grace, his power, his ability, his heart, his stick to itness. Oh, we need a savior and we have one. He saved us from the just punishment that we had coming. He saved us just like those Israelites from slavery. What's our slavery? The slavery of eternal death which would last just forever. He saved us. He took on our greatest enemy and won. And so the story of Deborah and J.L., just one that shows us how desperate we were, just like those Israelites, and how we have peace through our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's point one. Point two, God is in charge, okay? No matter what, no matter what it looks like, God is in charge charge. And I'll tell you, sometimes he's easy to miss in the book of Judges. Sometimes he seems absent, but he never is. He works his will. And today's story gives us a glimpse that he will right every wrong. And if not now, he will soon enough. You don't need to grab the hammer. He holds the hammer. Scores will be settled in his just time. But until that time, hey, if you, if you look at the story and you're like, I need rescue, all you gotta do is cry out to him. If I said something about the wandering part and you're like, oh man, that's kind of me. Repent, turn back, come on, let's go. How about this? If you are willing to be an instrument in the hand of God, then step up. If you haven't stepped up in a while, step up. He's gifted each and every one of you. Now, maybe it's the gift of leadership. Maybe it's the gift of teaching. Maybe it's the gift of serving. Maybe... It's the gift of giving. Maybe it's the gift of hospitality. Maybe it's being a dad. Maybe it's being a mom. Maybe it's being right now a son, a daughter. A lot of maybes. But here's the fact, man. Here's the truth. Last point. God is not finished with you. He's got you and he joys, just delights to work with you. He loves you. After all, he's your dad. Always. Amen.